Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome to the 18th uh, lecture of this particular course on surface engineering. Uh, though it is a course on surface engineering, but uh, uh, this one and the very next one, these two lectures will be devoted to the strengthening mechanism, which are not necessarily only mean for surface engineering, but generally is applicable to the bulk as well. But it is important that we understand these strengthening mechanisms, so that we are in a better position to uh, follow the uh, possible interaction of the surfaces with various kinds of mechanical forces. So, for example, uh, we begin, we would also like to divide this uh, whole strengthening mechanism related discussion into two parts. The first part today is about metallic materials, where the strengthening or uh, deformability both are primarily related to the ease or otherwise of dislocation movement on the slip planes. And uh, tomorrow we will uh, discuss in the next lecture on um, strengthening mechanism applicable to non-metallic materials. Now, talking about metals and alloys, uh, we are already aware what we are talking about. We are talking about essential and aggregate where the uh, cations are permeated, cations are arranged in three dimension in regular and repeated manner uh, with a three dimensional periodicity. And, uh, this periodic array is permeated by free electron cloud. So, this is exactly the definition which allows us to explain all possible properties of metallic aggregates. Now, um, the two color codes here essentially mean that, uh, for example, um, this first part is uh, uh, for the, let us say, uh, this set of uh, strengthening mechanisms, they are uh, typically applicable to single phase materials. So, metals and alloys which essentially are single phase, uh, whatever is the composition, uh, they remain single phase and they do not undergo any uh, typical uh, phase transformations possible in other alloys, uh, for example, no invariant transformations. Whereas, the remaining set of uh, transformations are meant for uh, two or multi phase material. Uh, of course, it does not mean that these kind of uh, strengthening mechanisms uh, of, uh, of this side uh, cannot be uh, used uh, at all. So, whatever is applicable to the single phase uh, strengthening can also, be uh, can also be applied to two phase or multi phase materials to some extent, but let us uh, get into the details of it. So, um, The first one uh, is about solid solution strengthening. So, just imagine that if you are able to pack a certain amount of uh, sugar in water or salt in water, they dissolve up to a certain extent and uh, when you dissolve, then the, uh, the taste changes. So, over here in metallic systems, which we assume are all crystalline substances, if you pack in uh, materials, which uh, could either be uh, for example, uh, bigger in size, uh, a smaller in size or bigger in size. So, if this is smaller than the usual lattice atoms, then these uh, lattice planes, they tend to collapse and move towards the smaller atom. Yet, you create a stress field around this region. So, this is the stress field that you create, but this stress field essentially will be tensile in nature because they are uh, essentially uh, the atoms are dilated. On the other hand, if you, um, if you actually uh, have an atom which is bigger in size, so obviously due to the bigger size, the lattice planes will be moved away and hence the, uh, the pushing tendency will be towards the right and the reaction to that, the residual stress of that will be towards the uh, foreign atom. So, you create essentially a compressive stress field around that. Now, in either cases, since you create a stress field around this, 
So when you have a dislocation which is trying to move along a particular plane, then it encounters a certain uh, obstacle because this is the foreign atom which is either smaller or bigger, but it has a certain stress field around it. So while trying to negotiate this particular dislocation, we'll have to face or uh, need a, re a, a different kind of a, a, a shear stress to be able to overcome this. So as a result, the motion of this or the uh, speed or the uh, velocity of this dislocation is uh, different. And as a result, the strength may uh, actually increase. So uh, there's a limit up to which, of course, you can pack in solute atoms into the material, and that is dictated by the equilibrium solubility. But uh, here you can see, for example, if you pack, if you are able to uh, introduce certain amount of uh, these interstitial elements like carbon, nitrogen, or and so on. So here in this case, even with very small amount of uh, solute atoms, the strength uh, very drastically can increase. But for most of the other elements, actually, the strengthening occurs because of uh, this uh, solid solution strengthening. Now. Um, The other possibility could be, um, for example, if you introduce uh, deformation. So, if you say, for example, you take a roll, you take a roll, and um, and in this between the two rolls, if you are allowing this stock to be rolled in between, so you squeeze and you deform, and what comes out actually is of uh, smaller thickness compared to this thickness. So, in this situation when such a huge amount of deformation takes place, this is essentially made possible through again the dislocation movement. So, if this material here before deformation has a certain density of dislocation, after the deformation this side the material will have lot more dislocation density. And these dislocation densities will actually also create certain impediment against movement of other dislocations. So, if you have a particular boundary and if this is, these are the set of dislocations already piled up. So, next time a new dislocation arrives, these dislocations will come in the way and as a result, the strength of the material will go higher uh, uh, as we uh, introduce more and more amount of dislocations. So, this is what is exactly explained here that at very low, so this is how the uh, amount of uh, cold work is increasing. Of course, uh, these deformations are uh, necessarily below the recrystallization temperature, otherwise there will be um, uh, dynamic recrystallization or annihilation of dislocations. But if the deformation is done below the recrystallization temperature, so for example, at a given, uh, in a given condition as we uh, uh, deform, so this is the typical stress strain diagram. This is the yield stress, this is the tensile strength and then the uh, stress drops and eventually material fails here. So, this if this is the stress strain diagram for a particular level of uh, dislocation density or state of stress internal strain and as you keep increasing the amount of strain in this direction as we what we see is that the, uh, the, amount, the yield strength increases from this level to this level to this level and eventually to very high level. So, this increase in yield strength, gradual increase in yield strength is made possible purely because of increase in dislocation density as we introduce more and more deformation. And as we know that these deformations can be uh, essentially done through such kind of uh, processes like rolling or extrusion or drawing or various other kinds of mechanical um, uh, processing uh, techniques. Now, uh, as we go to uh, uh, other possibilities, for example, uh, in an alloy, uh, if you have uh, at least two components, uh, the solute and the solvent, let us say this, uh, the green ones are, um, the green ones are uh, one type of atom, let us say A and the red one is B. So, we are dealing with two kinds of uh, atoms A and B. If they are arranged in a very ordered manner, very just like the, uh, the way the military uh, uh, is, uh, I mean they behave very in a disciplined manner. So, for example, if we impose a particular discipline that the red guy has to be next only to a green guy and likewise. 
So we'll always see an alternate sequence of red, green, red, green and so on. But this is very, very, uh, not very usual situation. Uh, this can be made possible only when in a given uh, condition where delta H is highly negative and this uh, uh, enthalpy of the transformation is so negative that uh, below, uh, in the phase diagram, below a certain temperature, we see uh, uh, if this is the, uh, if this is the comp uh, temperature axis and if this is the composition axis, then maybe there is a particular region where we see uh, a dome like this, which essentially says that this is the critical temperature and below which you actually have a completely ordered solid solution. And this ordered solid solution can be substitutional or interstitial in nature, uh, depending upon the relative size of the solute atom. So here, for example, you are seeing that the solute atom is tiny little and is able to go into the interstices of the material. So we can end up getting an ordered interstitial solid solution or interstitial compound. Otherwise, we can have an ordered interstitial alloy, for example, Ni3Al or uh, in, in case of, uh, for example, here we can have an interstitial compound like Fe3C and so on. So in all these cases, when we have such an ordered array, then uh, the uh, stress field undergoes a periodic or cyclic change. And as a result of that, when any dislocation is trying to negotiate this field, uh, it has to actually, uh, it sees a very different kind of a situation than what it normally sees when you have random. A random means that essentially I have, this is, if these are the arrays of atoms in a given plane, then uh, there is no necessity that this has to be green, this has to be green and this has to be red. In an ordered fashion, we always see like that. But in a random situation, this can very well be uh, green and this can be red, the next one can be red, again it can be green. So these are all random se sequences. We can also have a situation where uh, the crystallite arranges themselves in a particular um, crystallographic orientation. In other words, uh, these are the planes which actually are arranged parallel to the surface and they are of a particular crystallographic type. So that means the density of atoms, planar density of atoms on these planes is of a particular type and majority of the crystallites in a polycrystalline aggregate are so arranged that these set of planes are parallel to the surface. So in such a situation, uh, as you have multiple grains, let's say one, two, three, four, in all these cases, if these crystallites are so arranged that um, the, the, the dislocations will see one set of planes for negotiation, and if these planes have relatively higher um, uh, 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 shear strength, then the dislocations will face more difficulty to move there. So bringing in a particular preferred crystallographic orientation whereby the crystallographic planes which actually pose problems for dislocation movement can actually raise the strength of the material and that's called texture strengthening. Now one of the most effective and uh, uh, most I would say uh, widely applied uh, strengthening mechanism is called precipitation hardening. Now, if you imagine any alloy where uh, this is, let's say, a binary alloy, and uh, if we have a situation where the solid solubility decreases with temperature very significantly, and if you take an alloy like this of this particular composition, and if you equilibrate at uh, a temperature like this, which is uh, going to give you a single phase microstructure. So in the, in the microstructure, you'll have a single phase, all are alpha. And as you bring it to lower temperature, you are going to see the precipitation of the second phase, let's say beta. So this microstructure will now convert into a situation where you have precipitates. And these are so-called beta precipitates in alpha matrix. So in a situation where you have uh, this alpha and beta, beta precipitates, uh, uh, appearing into the matrix of alpha, uh, usually th this is nothing unusual, this is most usual, but a special subset of these kind of precipitates which also are able to maintain uh, coherency or the precipitate which are coherent with the matrix, they actually uh, pose 
uh, they actually can offer a very high uh, strengthening uh, as a function of time in this kind of an aging treatment. So if you, if you consider this to be uh, a particular uh, alloy, typically this is very well known in aluminum 4.5% uh, copper alloy or the duralumin alloy. In this alloy, what we know is that as we uh, age at a single phase region and then bring it to lower temperature, either bring to room temperature and then uh, again heat up artificially to hold at this temperature or we directly transfer to this temperature. In either case, when we see appearance of these beta precipitates into the matrix, if these precipitates not only undergo precipitation due to decrease in solid solubility, but they are also able to maintain coherency then these precipitates are bound to provide very high resistance to dislocation movement. In a situation like this, the dislocation while trying to negotiate a precipitate like this will move up and then we will have to encounter a region of this precipitate uh, so called zones which actually can uh, have very high or very different elastic modulus and as a result the precipitate will offer a great deal of strengthening to the matrix. But when you overage, that means if this is the time axis and if this is the, um, uh, the, the strength axis, um, then if you overage, that means if you age for longer than this peak aging period, then beyond this period, the precipitates which earlier on were coherent will lose their coherency and will convert into incoherent precipitates. So when they are incoherent, then what it means is that this precipitate, for example, didn't have any clear-cut boundary with the matrix. So that's why if this is the matrix and if this is the precipitate, this alpha-beta interface was completely coherent. So a dislocation cannot make out any difference between alpha and beta. Of course, uh, I must clarify that the precipitate, when you say beta, it cannot be considered as a coherent precipitate anymore. It has to be an incoherent bed. So convention wise they are called zones. Typically in aluminum, silicon, aluminum copper alloys they are called the GP zones. So whether it, they are GP zones or uh, theta prime or theta double prime precipitates, they are still able to maintain coherency or semi-coherency. But when they move across for longer aging period and convert themselves into equilibrium precipitates which is theta. So when theta forms then these theta theta alpha matrix is no longer coherent but incoherent and as a result uh, you lose the coherency strengthening but you enter into a different regime which is called R1 strengthening regime. That also offers uh, mo uh, impedi uh, impediment to dislocation movement but here the, the uh, obstruction is slightly of different type. The dislocations tend to bow and when they tend to bow like this Eventually, there could be possibilities of annihilation at this point and then you leave behind a loop and this loop is going to further uh, provide uh, uh, hindrance to dislocation movement. So um, this is in the nutshell various possibilities of strengthening mechanisms in um, the alloys. Uh, we also need to uh, uh, learn a little bit more in details about uh, uh, about uh, steel, the uh, the very uh, the one of the most widely used and utilized uh, structural material, but this is a subject by itself. All we need to understand at this moment is something very simple: that this is the uh, this is the so-called uh, uh, iron cementite diagram. I am very specifically mentioning this as iron cementite because this is a metastable diagram. And we essentially need to understand about three possible uh, invariant transformations, the peritectic, the eutectic and eutectoid. Out of all these, uh, these are involving liquid states. So our, most of our activities for structural applications will be uh, confined only to the region below this temperature zone. And which means we will be concerned with this so called eutectoid transformations, which involves transformation of austenite into ferrite and cementite. Now uh, this can be made use of or utilized for various purposes. So when uh, this eutectoid transformation takes place uh, at slightly higher temperature or slightly at a slightly uh, slower rate, for example somewhat like this, 
then you are likely to see pearl light. If you have the possibility of holding and then cooling like this, then you are likely to see bainite. And instead, if you quench very fast, then you are likely to see martensite. So, these two are phase aggregates, whereas martensite per se is an extended solid solution, a supersaturated solid solution, but differs from the other two in the fact that it is a shear transformation product. Suffice to know at this stage that martensite gives you the hard, it is the hardest possible solid solution in uh, iron carbon or iron cementite system because of which you get the maximum amount of hardening. So, even on surface, depending on whether you have perlite or bainite or martensite, the mechanical B properties at the surface is going to be vastly different. And in fact, uh, taking advantage of this uh, situation, um, uh, typically one can actually uh, think of uh, uh, adopting a possibility of this so that you have perlite. The second possibility is to have bainite. And as I said, the third possibility is uh, martensite. So, in terms of CV rate of quench, this is rather slow process, this is moderately fast and this is the fastest. So, as a result of formation of martensite, which is a non-cubic product, a so called tetragonal product, there are many other reasons as to why martensite is uh, the hardest solid solution. You actually can convert the surface of steel to very high, uh, to, to make it very, very strong and very resistant and so on. Uh, you may also like to bring in certain uh, changes in the temp in the uh, as hardened condition and particularly for alloy steel you may actually like to convert this martensite into what is known as uh, uh, the tempered martensite and most importantly apart from tempered martensite what you also can bring in also are called the alloy carbides. So, when you bring in this alloy carbides, you actually see a further strengthening possibility. So, if this is the so called Vickers hardness and this is the time at an isothermal temperature T1, so typically after martensitic uh, hardening, hardening, you will see that um, the hardness actually will constantly decrease, but then there could be a possibility of another hump coming. And this is the so called um, uh, fourth stage of tempering which gives rise to this alloy carbides. And uh, this is called secondary hardening also, uh, but then this is uh, prerogative of the alloy steels, not generally any kind of steel. Now, um, we uh, need to now go uh, to the other possibilities. For example, martensitic transformation is something which we have already discussed. Uh, uh, at this point, I just would like to mention that the when you talk of perlites, you are talking about lamellar structure like this. When you are talking of uh, uh, bainite, then you are talking about uh, a ferritic sheave with carbide stringers uh, decorated like this. But when you are talking about martensite, then you actually are talking about either the acicular or the uh, martensitic um, lath structures. Uh, because of these sharp boundaries and ultra fine size, martensite always is much harder and much stronger than either perlite or bainite. Now, this is something which we will discuss in greater details very soon, but uh, at the moment let me also tell you that if you do not have these uh, alloying elements present, for example, hypothetically speaking, if we have something which is a single component and a single phase. So, when you are talking about something which is uh, not only single phase, but also single component, that means you are talking about a pure element A. How do you strengthen this pure a metal, which is pure metal? So, there are a few possibilities, one which we saw already in the beginning, which is strain hardening. That means, if you deform this material, you certainly introduce a higher density of dislocations and this dis higher dislocation density can actually provide you uh, strengthening. And this is exactly the strategy adopted in, for example, shot pinning or any amount of surface deformation procedures. When you, uh, uh, but when you have, uh, uh, when you cannot do this, for example, when you cannot shot pin, another possibility is that you simply roll. So, when you do rolling either skin pass or um, or slightly higher level of deformation, 
when you roll and then subsequently when you anneal these rolled structures, then uh, this uh, structure is going to give you what is known as recrystallization or recrystallized uh, structures. And in the process, the grain average grain size, if this was so big, now could be much smaller. So when the, uh, when the crystallite size is uh, refined to this small level, uh, significantly uh, refined, then the amount of grain boundary area, so essentially we are talking about a situation where earlier the grain size, average grain size was so big and from this because of recrystallization, uh, if we make it uh, much smaller, for example, uh, very, very small grains like this, then obviously the total area of boundaries in this particular situation, the specific surface area per unit volume would be much higher here compared to this situation. So, if we uh, convert this coarse grain structure into this fine grain structure, the specific boundary area per unit volume is going to go up significantly high. And we all know that this boundary is actually nothing but a barrier or a, or a, or a wall for uh, against the movement of this dislocation. So, when you try to move this dislocation, it merely moves until this particular boundary then sees a barrier and stops. So, all dislocations, if these are the parallel slip planes, all dislocations which are trying to move will certainly face a barrier here and stop. And this can happen also for dislocations moving from the other sides. So, if you increase such barrier or walls more and more, then obviously the amount of resistance to dislocation movement should go up. And as a result, the yield strength goes up as a function of uh, decrease in crystallite size, as a function of decrease in crystallite size, and because of which we actually see a very significant strengthening. And this strengthening is known by this famous relationship proposed independently by Hall and Pech, uh, and which clearly shows that the yield strength is uh, inversely related to the average diameter of the grain. Now, so this uh, uh, possible uh, strengthening uh, mechanism certainly is all these possible strengthening mechanisms, they are very useful to us uh, not only when we are trying to negotiate with the bulk, but also trying to uh, uh, tailor the microstructure and composition of the surface so that the structural properties, the mechanical properties of the surface is improved. So, uh, let us try and uh, recapitulate some of the points that we have discussed in this particular lecture. The first thing I would like to draw your attention is that what we have discussed here is that the stra general strategies of strengthening for metallic, ceramic and polymeric actually are different. They are not one and the same. But since we have discussed only about metals in this particular discourse, let us not worry much about ceramic and polymeric and what we must uh, take away from today's lecture is that most of the structural properties, namely the strength or uh, hardness and uh, various other strength properties, they are somewhere or other related to the ease or difficulty of dislocation movement in the crystallite. So, metals are predominantly or 99 percent crystalline except for the boundary regions, the rest of the areas or volume is all crystalline having uh, uh, three dimensional periodicity. And whatever strength, if you want to deform this metal without having any dislocation, then you require to overcome the theoretical shear strength. If you have a dislocation, then these dislocations can actually help you deform the material, plastic deformation, permanent deformation at a shear stress level which is easily 1000 times or more less than uh, 1000 or 10,000th of the theoretical shear strength. So, whenever you deform essentially the presence of dislocations help. So, by the same logic if you make movement of dislocation difficult then you strengthen and this is exactly the strategy that is adopted. Now, this uh, opposition or so called uh, resistance to dislocation movement can be brought in by either by bringing in precipitates which are which could be coherent initially and then subsequently become incoherent. 
So whether they are coherent or incoherent, they offer uh, resistance to dislocation movement. You can increase the grain boundary area. That's how you can strengthen the material. You can pack in more and more amount of solute atoms, either smaller or bigger than the matrix atom, and create either compressive or tensile stress field around them. And as a result, the uh, strength uh, or the dislocation movements would be impeded. Um, there's another question that when we make material strong, when we make it too strong, there is a possibility that the material will not be able to take deformation anymore. For example, if a material is normally showing a stress strain diagram like this, you make it stronger, it will go like that. But when you make it ultra strong, it might not show any plastic region at all and might fail at this very uh, point itself. So it's not enough that we only increase the yield strength or so-called tensile strength. We also have to make sure that there is sufficient amount of plasticity involved or plasticity or plastic deformation possible. So we have to play uh, sort of uh, look for a compromise between strengthening and uh, sacrificing ductility or deformability. Uh, there are techniques where you actually can have a very good compromise between both strength and toughness. Uh, we did uh, briefly mention about the uh, possibilities of strengthening of steel, but I promise that uh, we'll very soon go into another lecture where we'll discuss in greater details about strengthening mechanisms of uh, steel and nonmetals uh, will be discussed. The strengthening of nonmetals will be discussed in the very next lecture. Thank you very much.